Between 2014 and 2016, approximately 120 women, almost all of, all of whom were poor and the majority of whom were white, were prosecuted by the state of Tennessee for the crime of fetal assault. They were accused of taking narcotics during their pregnancy and, and of harming their infants as a result. Those who supported the law said that the prosecutions would lead to treatment. They said that the dis through the discipline of the court system, these bad read white mothers, giving birth to these babies would be transformed. They would become good white mothers. If it worked, fantastic. If it didn't, they would get the punishment they deserved. In 2016, though, the law sunset. So after that point, this particular conduct was no longer a crime. One might ask why, then, why you would want to read or write a book about these prosecutions. The answer is that Tennessee's fetal assault story is a devastatingly clear example of the idea of criminalizing care. In short, as I argue in my forthcoming book, for those we stigmatize, for those who are poor, often black and brown, but also poor and white, our systems say that the only kind of care they deserve is care mixed with punishment. To understand just how strange this story is, let's start with some legal basics. Our society has many, many institutions, many of which are structured through law. The purpose of some of these legal systems, think Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, public housing, is to provide care and support. Other systems are set up to punish. The strange thing today, though, is that in poor communities all too often, these two sets of systems merge. My book explains through a detailed exploration of the fetal assault law cases and the systems in which they were housed, what happens as a result of the merger. With that to the example, as you can see from this slide in which red represents more prosecutions and green represents none, prosecutions took place predominantly in the northeastern Appalachian area of the state. In addition, there were about 25 prosecutions in Shelby County, the home of, Knock of not of Knoxville, of Memphis. Although, as you will recall, those who supported the law said it was about providing treatment. When I looked at the actual case files, what became clear was that this rhetoric of treatment was mostly just a smokescreen hiding punishment. In the vast majority of cases, there was no indication in the criminal court file that the women were offered any treatment. Instead, despite the promises of those who supported the law, the jail would play no role Women spent time in jail but both before pleading guilty for an average of 62 days in East Tennessee, and they served jail sentences after pleading guilty of up to a year in jail. The cases were also emblematic of systemic problems in misdemeanor prosecutions, despite significant evidence that many of the women were in fact not guilty of the crime, the vast majority pled guilty. There were no motions filed, no hearings held, no trials held. Instead, as is the case on the low end of the criminal system all too often, the prosecutions were all too often about the money. Displayed in this slide is one cost sheet indicating that this woman owed the courts almost $4,000 in costs and fees. So in the majority of cases, the rhetoric of care was nothing more than a smokescreen hiding punishment. But what about care? In some cases, the women did receive treatment as part of their prosecution. What's clear, though, is that in poor communities, care is increasingly only available inside punishment systems. That this particular form of care comes at high cost, high risk, and all too often in a deeply corrupted form. To understand how this happens, you need to understand how law and practice interact. In the book, I trace the, trace the ways in which law enabled presumptively confidential information to travel from the healthcare to the family regulation or child welfare system and ultimately into the criminal system, serving as the basis for prosecution. These cases reflect a devastating reality. This reality was perhaps clearest in the words of Cindy Jones, a drug treatment coordinator in a small rural court in Appalachia. When I asked her how she gets care to those in her community, she responded, lock them up, clean them up, start them over. In other words, criminalization is the road to care. Over and over again, this is the story I heard. In poor communities, if you want drug treatment or mental health care or other forms of care, the court system is the place to go. 
So as Carolyn Suffren teaches in her book, Jail Care, care in poor communities comes all too often at the price of risk, surveillance, and punishment. Certainly those in punishment systems need care. The problem though is that proximity to punishment affects the content and quality of care. As one woman affected by the fetal assault law said, the laws in effect prevented it from being a care issue. It became a law, a liability issue. Proximity to punishment all too often puts judges instead of doctors and patients in charge of medical decisions. As Dr. Stephen Lloyd, who served as medical director of substance abuse services in Tennessee at the time stated, judges are in effect practicing medicine without a license. <laughs> One devastating effect is that care decisions themselves are corrupted. Patients are deprived of essential medical care when jailed. They are encouraged to take medication preferred by agencies or courts, even when they and their doctors might decide differently, or they avoid treatment because of the legal effects and legal risks of the decisions. So what do we do? First, separate care systems from punishment systems by eliminating and narrowing the legal pathways that allow communication between those systems. Second, eliminate the on-the-ground reality for far too many that punishment is the road to care, and finally significantly grow care systems and shrink punishment systems. But legal reforms are one thing, and fundamental transformation is another. Ultimately, as reproductive justice teaches, the answers lie in placing on the government and society the obligation to create conditions under which women, families, and communities can realize the human right to self-determination.